So we're going to go ahead and get started. And usually what happens is we cover one, maybe two sections every class period. And so we've got enough time, to, I think, today to cover a section. You've got your homework packet. We're not going to cover all of that today. We're just going to cover one, one. We'll do one, two on Thursday. So we're going to go ahead and get started. First of all, make sure you can see the screen here. You can't, you should say something, because I can, I can see it up here, but just make sure you can see it. If it's not dark enough or it's too bright, let me know when I can adjust it. But we're going to go ahead and get started with 1.1. Everybody got the homework packet? So let's try to go ahead and focus on, on our lecture here real quick. 1.1 is all about equations. And we need to learn some basics. So we're going to learn about the difference between an equation and an expression. Now an equation has an equal sign. Uh, let's be quiet, please. That way we can we can focus on the lecture. So an equation it has an equal sign and it can be solved. So here's an example of an equation. 3x minus 4 equals 8. Another example would be 5x equals 2x minus 1. Those are examples of equations. Okay. And again, we're just starting off the very basics. So an equation has an equal sign and it can be solved. And these are just two examples. We're going to learn how to solve them in a moment. We do need to learn some definitions. So these are equations. Now, what's the difference between an equation and an expression? Well, an expression has no equal sign, and it cannot be solved. Now, you might be able to work with an expression and condense it down, but you can't actually solve it for x. And so these are some examples of expressions. 5x plus 4, 8x minus 9. Okay, those are going to be examples of expressions. Now, we really can't do a lot with expressions. We might be able to combine them together. But we do need to know the difference between an equation and an expression. And the only difference is the equal sign. That is the only difference between these. So the only difference between an equation and an expression is going to be the equal sign. Now in the first chapter, we're going to focus primarily on equations. And there are three basic types of equations. And you've probably seen these before. But we're going to start with the first type of equation, and that's called condition. So we're going to learn first about conditional equations. And conditional equations, they can be solved for an answer. Most equations are going to be conditional. Also, when I give you definitions, I don't necessarily give you the same as the textbook. I try to put it in words that you can understand. So when we talk about conditional equations, these are equations that we can solve for an answer. And so an example of a conditional equation would be 9x minus 5 equals 3x plus 2. So this is an, going to be a conditional equation. And that means we can solve it and we can get a solution. 
Now you're probably already familiar with how to solve this type of equation. What I like to do is get the variable on the left, numbers go to the right, so we'll move the 3x over with subtraction, and we'll add the 5. So then we've got 9x minus 3x, that makes it 6x on the left. And then on the right, we have 2 and a 5, add those together, we get our 7. We divide by our 6, and now we get our solution. So in this case, x equals 7 sixths. And that's the way I want you to leave the answer. The only time I want a decimal is when the original question has a decimal. Okay, so if it's got a, a decimal, then you can use decimals. If it doesn't, then just keep the fractions. And 7, 6 won't reduce down. Now, why is this conditional? It's conditional because we solved it and we got an answer. And most equations are conditional. The next type of equation is going to be a contradiction. And a contradiction is a false statement. Now, the way I remember these is I think of a contradiction as if you go to a court of law and they claim that you gave contradictory testimony. What does contradictory testimony mean? That means you lied. But you gave a false statement. So a, a contradiction is the same thing. It's a false statement. It's something that doesn't work. Now, here's an example. of a contradiction. How about 5x minus 9 equals how about 4x plus x minus 15. So this is an equation. Now, we are not going to be able to get an actual answer. We're going to get a false statement. And where we begin is before we move across the equal bars, we always combine like terms. So these can be combined together on the right. So that's 5x minus 15. And the left-hand side is 5x minus 9. Now what's going to be different about this one <clears throat> is when we move, 5x over, it cancels out, right? So if we subtract off that 5x to move it over, it's gone. And now look at what we've got. Now we have this. Okay, the x's are gone. And does negative 9 equal negative 15? Is that a true statement? No. So that's a false statement. So that's a contradiction. And it has no solution. And we represent that with the empty or the null set. So it's a contradiction. And it has no solution. Because it is a false statement. And we're just kind of going over some basic definitions to begin with. And the very last type of equation that we have to look at is going to be the identity. And the identity, the sides are going to be the same. So that's the basic definition of the identity. The sides are the same. Now, how do I remember 
what identity is? Well, I think of identical twins. Right? And what do we know about identical twins? They're the same, aren't they? So when we work with these equations, if we can manipulate them to get the sides to be exactly the same, they're an identity. Now, they may not look the same to begin with, but after we do some algebra, they're going to come out to be the same. So let's look at a, a, a very easy example of an identity. So how about we have 3 times 2x plus 5, and we're going to set that equal to about 4x plus 2x plus 15. So we're going to go ahead now and we're going to look at this equation. And why is it an equation? Because we have an equal sign, right? That's our basic definition. And you're probably familiar with how to solve these, but what are we going to do first? Well, we always get rid of our parentheses first, so we distribute the 3 through. So we distribute that 3 through. And we've got 3 times 2, that makes it a 6x. And then we've got 3 times 5, that makes it a 15. On the right-hand side, those are the same. They can be added together because they are like terms. So that is a 6x. And then we've got a plus 15. Now, we did a little bit of algebra to get to this step. But what do we notice about these? Well, we can stop here because these are exactly the same. These are the same. And if they are the same, this is called an identity. And your solution set is all real numbers. You can also write negative to positive infinity. But the textbook uses all real numbers, so that's what I'll be using as well. So now that we've seen the three basic types of equations, now we're going to start working with them. So we're now going to be solving some equations. So I'm just going to make up some equations. We'll go through them. We're going to do some that have decimals, some that have fractions. We're going to focus primarily on fractions because that's what we struggle the most with. Students always struggle the most with fractions and how to handle them. So we're going to go ahead and begin with this equation. And we're going to solve this equation. When I teach, I make up equations to solve. And I also pull some from the textbook. So we'll make up some. And then we'll also pull some from the textbook as well. So let's start with one that has a fraction in it. Just so we remember how to solve these. This one's going to be an equation that has fractions. When I teach how to solve equations with fractions, what I do is I clear them out. A lot of times when students see fractions, they see, they see these as more difficult than others, and they're not. A lot of times fractions seem intimidating, so we're going to get rid of them. So what I usually do is I get rid of the fractions to begin with. Once they're gone, then we solve. So when I look at this, I look at my fractions and I look at my denominators. So I have a 3 and I have a 6 down here. So I want to find the least common denominator of 3 and 6. Well, the least common denominator of 3 and 6 is going to be a 6, right? The 6 goes into itself, and 6 goes into 3 twice. 
once I have found that least common denominator, then what I do is I multiply every part by that least common denominator. I always like to draw arrows, that way we don't lose track of things. So we're going to go ahead and put that 6 out in front, and we're going to distribute it through. Now, how we clear these fractions is we divide by the number down below, and we multiply by the number on the top. So divide and multiply. This is the absolute easiest way to work with these fractions. So we've got 6. 6 divided by 3. Well, 6 divided by 3 is a 2. And 2 times the 4 makes it an 8x. So we divide it and then multiply. Now, if there's nothing down below, then we multiply. So 6 times a negative 5. That gives you then a negative 30. Next one, 6 divided by 6 is 1. 1 times 7 makes it a 7x. 6 times 1 is a 6. Now all the fractions are gone, and we've got something that we can work with. And again, this might be a review for a lot of you, but I want to make sure we have a really good foundation. Very, very important that we can solve equations. So how do we work this one out? Well, we'll move things around. So I'm going to subtract off the 7x, and I'm going to add the 30 to move it over as well. And then I've got 8 minus 7. That makes it a single x. The 30s can cancel, right? The 7x's cancel, and 6 and a 30 makes it a 36. There's my answer. Now, what type of equation is it? Is it an identity, conditional, or a contradiction? Which one? Does anyone remember? It's going to be conditional, right? Why is it conditional? Because we have an answer. Okay, we solved it. We got an answer. So that means this would be conditional. Let's try another one. Fractions are what always trips up students. So we're going to spend quite a bit of time just refreshing these fractions and how to solve them. So let's do another one. A little bit different on this one. So this one is going to be done the same way that we did the others, the last question. It is a little bit more difficult. But it's going to be done the exact same way. So first thing we do is we notice that we have fractions, and we've got all these denominators. Now what I do is I group them in, in pairs. So I work with each, each kind of set separately, and then put them together. So let's see about the least common denominator of a 4 and a 5. Well, 4 and a 5, do 4 and 5 have anything in common? No, they have nothing in common. So the least common denominator of 4 and 5 would be a 20, right? Because we multiplied them together and we got a 20. Now let's take that 20. And look at it with 3. So what's the least common denominator of that 20 that we found in the 3? Well, how would we begin? We first look at our 20. Okay, and here's how you find these denominators. 20. Does 20 evenly divide by 3? No. So that doesn't work. Then we move up. 20 times 2 is a 40. Does 40 divide evenly by 3? No. Nope. And then we have 20 times 3, which is 60. Does 60 divide evenly by 3? Yes, it does. All right. So what's the least common denominator of 20 and 3? That's going to be a 60. 
And then finally, what's the least common denominator of the 60 that we found and the 2 here? Well, does 60 evenly divide by 2? It does, doesn't it? Right? 60 evenly divides by 2. So the least common denominator of 60 and 2 is going to be a 60. So now we found our denominator. The least common denominator is a 60. So that means we're going to place our 60 out in front. And we're going to divide. And we're going to multiply. need to, you can use a calculator. Sometimes these numbers get a little bit larger, so that, that's fine. Use a calculator. I have no problem with using a calculator. So where are we going to begin? We're going to take our 60, okay? We're going to divide that by 5. 60 divided by 5 is a 12. 12 times 8 makes it a 96. Excellent. Then we do the next piece. 60 divided by 4. Well, 60 divided by 4 that's 15. 15 times 1 makes it a 15. Is everyone okay with what I'm doing? Divide, multiply. Divide, multiply. Next one, 60 divided by 3. 20 times 7, that makes it 140. So bring your x down as well. 60 divided by 2, that's a 30. I'm just putting it up here so you can see. 60 divided by 2 is a 30. 30 times that negative 1 that makes it a negative 30. Now we have something that we can work with, right? All the fractions are gone. We can now move all the variables to the left. Numbers go to the right. So I'm going to move that 140x over. And move that 15 over as well. And when I moved that 15 over, it was positive, so I undo it with a negative. So we've got 96. We're going to take away that 140. Makes it a minus 44x there. 15s can cancel. The 140s cancel. And then we've got 30 and 15. They're both negative, so they go together, making it a negative 45. If you ever have any questions, just be sure and say something. Because I can I can break it down, I can I can explain it differently. We went on with that so far. Now, what do we want? Well, we want to solve this for our variable x. And so we're going to divide both sides by a negative 44. Now, we do not turn it into a decimal. We leave it as a fraction. And what do we know about a negative divided by a negative? Negative divided by a negative makes it a positive. And so that comes out to now be 45 over 44. There's our solution. And what type of equation is this? Conditional. Now let's look at another one, and I'll pull one from our textbook. So I do use the textbook, but I can also make up extra examples. So we're going to look at 1-1, one, one. and I'll just pick one of these from our textbook to look at here. Let's do a fraction one. Um, how about we look at Question 22 on page 110. So question 22 on page 110. If you don't have your textbook with you, that's okay. I'll just write it up on the screen. Okay, so here we'll work this one out here. Make sure I copy it correctly. This one's a little bit different from the last ones, but still has fractions in it. Okay, 
So. So, on the, yeah, if you're looking at the last, remember what we did. Why did this become positive? It became positive because a negative divided by a negative made it a what? Positive. And just so we can remember, how did we clear out our fractions? We got our least common denominator, and then we divided by the number down below, multiplied by the number on the top. So divide, multiply, divide, multiply. Okay, now let's look at this one. This is from our textbook. And so how would we solve this equation? Well, for this equation, we've got parentheses, so they're going to have to be dealt with first. Let me distribute through. And I always like to draw arrows just so we can keep track of things. So we're going to distribute those fractions through. And if you need to, remember you can always write these over one. So we just multiply by the top. So 2 times 1, that makes it a 2x over 15. 1 times 5 is a 5 over 15. Now you could reduce that down to a third. We don't really need to because we're going to get rid of it in a moment. But 5 over 15, we could reduce that down to a third. But that doesn't matter because it's going to be gone in a moment. Now we do the same thing on the next one. And you can write this as 1 9, or you can write this as x over 9 for the next one. And then we've got 1 times 2, that makes it a 2 over 9 here. And again, you could reduce that down to 1 third, but that makes another fraction. So we'll just keep with the 15 and the 9. And now we need to find the least common denominator of 15 and 9. And how do we do that? Well, I'm going to show you how we do that. We start with the larger number. So our larger number is 15. Okay. Now, does 15 evenly divide by 9? No. So that doesn't work. Then we take our larger number and we double it. 30. Does 30 divide by 9? No. How about 15 times 3? 45. Does 45 divide by 9? Yes, it divides evenly. So what's my least common denominator? 45. You can use factoring trees, but I think they're more confusing. So I just take the larger number and start multiplying until I find something that will go into the larger one evenly. Now we've got our 45. All right. And so now we multiply everything by that 45. So we're going to go ahead and multiply through here. What do we do? What's our procedure? Divide, multiply. Divide, multiply. And I know for a lot of you, you've probably seen this. This is a review but we have to make sure that we have the skills we need to be successful. And that's what I'm teaching you. So, 45 divided by 15. Okay. 45 divided by 15 is a 3. 3 times 2 makes it a 6. Bring down your x. Then we've got 45 divided by 15. Well, 45 divided by 15, that again is a 3. 3 times that 5, that makes it a 15. Next, 45 divided by 9. 45 divided by 9 is a 5. 5 times that x makes it a 5x. 45 divided by 9, that's a 5. 5 times the 2 on the top, that makes it a 10. Now we've got to the point where we can finish it easy equation to work with. What do we do? Move things around. Move that 5x over. Move that 15 over as well. Okay. And so what's going to happen here is 6x 
minus 5x, that leaves you with a single x. The 15's cancel, 5x is cancel, and then you've got 10 minus 15, that makes it a minus 5, and again this will be conditional. that sort of thing. And again, don't ever hesitate to ask questions. If there's something you don't understand, make sure you say something. Let's look at another type of fraction. This one requires a little bit of a different technique. And this one we're going to learn how to use cross multiplication. Okay, so this one's a little bit different. When we look at it, how is it different? Well, we've got a fraction equaling another fraction, right? Okay, so yeah, let's kind of kind of keep the, the noise down a bit. But what we're looking at here is we've got a fraction equaling another fraction. And we're going to use the technique called cross multiplication. Okay, and so when we cross multiply, this this works when we have a fraction equaling another fraction. When we cross multiply, we just draw our arrows like this. And we're going to cross multiply here. And we have to use parentheses. So that 4 comes down. And that's times 4x plus 3. Okay, cross, cross multiply that way. And then that's going to equal 5. The other way, 3x minus 5. So this is cross multiplication. And this looks like question 9 from your homework. If you see it, it looks very, very similar to that. A little bit different, but pretty much the same. So we cross multiplied, and now what do we do? Now we finish it by using our distributive property. And 4 times 4 is the 16. Bring down the x with it. 4 times 3 is a 12. Right hand side, 5 times 3 is a 15. Bring down the x. 5 times a minus 5, is that makes it a minus 25. Okay, move things around, and we're done here. So move that 15x over. And move that 12 over as well. Be careful with your signs. 16 minus 15. That leaves you with a 1. So that's 1x. Gone. Gone here. Okay. Now, what about the 25 and the 12? Well, these have the same signs, right? We're going to put them together. So we have a negative, And we add them. When they have the same signs, we add them together. So 25 and 12. So that makes it a 37. And again, this would be conditional. We're going to look at some identities and some contradictions in a moment. Now we've seen how to work with all these fractions. Now let's look at some identities again and some contradictions also. We pick a couple of these from our textbook. Once we understand these, then we'll look at literal equations, and then we'll talk about the difference between a linear and a nonlinear equation. So let me find a couple of these for us to look at. Okay, and let's look now at question 32. So page 111. Question number 32. And this one should come out to be an identity. So we've got one half. Oh, yep, sorry about that. Move it up here. So we've got one half times 
the 6x plus 20. That equals x plus 4 plus 2x, or sorry, 2 times x plus 3. So we're going to work through this one here. And this one should come out to be an identity. And remember, what is an identity? I think of identical twins, and that means they are the same. So the side should be the same. So let's go ahead now and distribute the half through. Now in this case, the half is going to cancel. So the fractions will actually cancel themselves out. And then we'll distribute that 2 through on the right-hand side as well. And the fractions are going to cancel because what's half of 6? Well, half of 6 is a 3. So that's your 3x. And what's half of 20? Okay, half of 20 is 10. The other side, we have an x plus 4. We're going to distribute that 2 through. That makes it a 2x now and an 8 plus 6. Now, I said this was going to be an identity because after we do some algebra, they're going to be the same. Okay, they look a little bit different right now, but look at what happens on the right. If I combine my like terms on the right, I end up with a 3x, and 4 and 6, that makes it a 10. So now both sides are the same. Okay. 3x plus 10 equals 3x plus 10. These are the same, and if they are the same, what is it? It's an identity. And what's our solution set? All real numbers. Okay. Now let's look at a contradiction. Question 36 is going to be our contradiction. Okay, so we're going to look at question 36 next. So I'll copy it down for us. And for question 36, we have a minus 6 times... 2x plus 1 minus 3 times x minus 4. And that's going to equal a minus 15x plus 1. What do we do? Distribute. Now, here's where students make a mistake. On these, when I distribute through, if it has a negative, I always like to circle it. I think it's easier. That way you won't lose the negative. So if I ever have to distribute a negative through, I like to circle it. That way we don't lose that negative sign. It's just something I'm used to doing when I teach elementary and intermediate algebra. It's just to show you those skills. So when I have a negative and I distribute it through, I circle it. That way I don't lose my negative. So now we distribute. Minus 6 times 2. It makes it a minus 12x. Minus 6 times 1. That's a minus 6. Minus 3 times x. That's a minus 3x. And watch your signs here. Negative 3 times a negative 4. Negative and negative makes it a positive 12. And that equals a negative 15x plus 1. These can go together because they're the same. So that makes it a minus 15x. Minus 6 and 12 can go together. Usually positive 6. And I'll slow down here just so we, we can keep up gotten to this step. Now, if those x's are the same, so we've got a minus 15x on the left and on the right. 
it's either going to be an identity or a contradiction at this point. If it was a plus six on both of them, it would be an identity. This one is not because those numbers are different. Okay? One and six are different. So when I add that 15x over, I'm now left with six equals one. And we know that six does not equal one. So that is a false statement. That's called a contradiction then. And we have no solution. So it's a contradiction. And it has no solution. Let's look at a question now that has square brackets. So let's, let's look at one that has some square brackets. So I'll make one up for us. I know there's some in the textbook here. But I'll just make up one with square brackets. And you'll see something with square brackets, like question number one. I'll do a different one. But when we have square brackets, we use them like parentheses. We just don't want a lot of extra sets of parentheses, so we use square brackets. So let's say I gave you this to solve. Now, why do we have square brackets? Well, I wouldn't want to use parentheses here because they've already got parentheses inside. Now, we're going to work on the left-hand side and the right-hand side separately. These square brackets behave exactly the same as parentheses. So first thing we do is work on the inside and we work our way out. So we're going to get our parentheses first. So we work these through, distribute the 2 through on the, the right-hand side, and distribute the 3 through on the left-hand side. 3 times x, that's a 3x. Three, 3 times a negative 1, that's a minus 3. And then we got a plus 5. On the right-hand side, we distribute the 2 through, so that's 10x a minus 2, and a plus 4. So we work on the inside, and we slowly work our way out. When we look at the left-hand side, we can combine those together, can't we? So the minus 3 and the 5 can go together, and that's going to make it now a 3x plus 2. Bring down that 4. On the right-hand side, I can put those together, and that's going to make it a positive 2. What do we need to do next? Well, the next step is going to be multiply that 4 through. So the distributor push that 4 through. So that's going to make it now a 12x plus 8. Right hand side is a 10x plus 2. Move things around, so move that 10x over with subtraction. And move the 8 over as well. And 12x minus 10x, that makes it a 2x. The 8s can cancel. The 10x's cancel. And 2 minus 8, that makes it a minus 6. Divide by our 2, and now we've got it. So x is now a negative 3. And we can label this as conditional, but you really don't need to, because as long as you get an answer, you know it's conditional. So if you want to label it as conditional, you can, but from now on, most of the time, we don't label them conditional. We understand that conditional means that you get a solution.
we'll just do long decimals real quick, and then we'll look at literal equations, and then we'll look at linear and nonlinear. So I should finish up maybe with a few minutes to spare. There's not much left to talk about. But we're going to go ahead now and look at an equation that has decimals. And let's say we have a minus 4 times 3.2x minus 1.9 equals negative 3 times a minus 1.4x minus 8.9. Now, some instructors may have you clear out the decimals. I don't. I feel like we have calculators, so we just use our calculator. Right? So all we have to do is just multiply through. We can use a calculator. Don't worry about clearing out the decimals. Just multiply through. So what do we have? We've got 4 times that 3.2. Now again, Whenever I distribute a negative, I always like to circle it. That way we don't lose a sign. It's very easy to lose a sign. And we've got that 4 times that 3.2. We know it's going to be negative, so that's going to be a minus 12.8x. What about the negative and negative here? Negative and negative makes it a positive. So 4 times 1.9, 7.6. On the right-hand side, we multiply again. Negative and negative makes it a positive. So we've got 3 times 1.4. Well, that's a positive 4.2x. Negative and negative makes it a positive again. And 3 times that 8.1. Well, that is a 24.3. Simple enough there. Now, all we have to do is solve it. Again, don't clear out the fractions. Some instructors may have had you clear them out. I think that's a waste of time. We don't need to. We have calculators. So move that 4.2x over. And move that 7.6 over as well. And we'll need a calculator here. Those are the same. So 12.2, or sorry, 12.8 plus 4.2. They're both negative, so we keep it negative 17. 7.6s, they cancel. 4.2s, they cancel. On the right-hand side, we have 24.3 minus 7.6. That comes out to be a 16.7. And it's positive. Why is it positive? Because the 24 is the larger number, and it's positive. And we divide by our negative 17. We know our answer is going to be negative. Okay, so now we can just divide by that 17. And we can take it out to two places. So we only had one, so we'll take it out to two places. Positive over negative makes it a negative, right? And that's going to be then a minus 0 0.98. Okay, we just round it to two places. That's going to be enough. Is everyone okay with how that works? Just use your calculator. And two places is enough in most cases. They may tell you what to round to as well. You might say round to three. Whatever it says to round to, you just round to that number of places. We've got two quick topics left to cover. And we're going to look quickly now at literal equations. And then we're going to talk about linear versus nonlinear equations. So let's now talk about literal equations. Literal equations are just equations that have more than one variable.
Okay, so literal equations are equations that have more than one variable. And I have to tell you what variable I want you to solve for. Now you've probably done these in other courses, and I'm only going to give you some simple ones, because these are the ones that you'll encounter when we get in chapter two and we start graphing. I'm going to have you solve these for one. So let's say I give you this one. Okay, this is a literal equation because it has more than one variable. All right, and I want to solve this for the variable y. How do I do that? Well, I need to get the y by itself on the left. So that 3x does not belong there because it doesn't have a y on it, and I'm solving for y. So I move that 3x over. Now we've got 2y equals a minus 3x plus 8. And we want to finish this, so we need to divide by 2 everywhere. And reduce it down if we can. So let's see if we can reduce. So when we reduce, that's going to be y equals minus 3 halves x. That doesn't reduce. But what about 8 over 2? Well, 8 over 2, that reduces down to a 4, doesn't it? There is your equation, solve for 1. And you probably also heard this called slope-intercept form. And when we go to graph lines, we have to solve it for y, and we use what's called slope-intercept form. And that's why I'm, I'm covering these now, because you're going to see them again in chapter. Let's do one more, and then we'll talk about linear and nonlinear equations. So I'm going to have you now solve again for the y. Solve this for that variable y. It is a literal equation because it has more than one variable. And we are solving for that variable y. So we take that 8x away, move it over. And minus 3y equals now a minus 8x minus 9. We now divide by our negative 3, and we reduce it down as much as we can. So now we've got y equals negative and negative makes it a positive, so that's 8 over 3x there. Negative and negative makes it a positive, 9 divided by 3 is a 3, and there is your answer. And we have now successfully solved it for y. So those are literal equations there. Okay. Now let's talk about the difference between linear and nonlinear. Very simple. These are questions 12 and 13. Non-calculational, it's just definitions. Linear equations only have the x. Not x squared, x cubed, the square root of x, anything like that. Or a fraction. Or something like 5 over x. So those are called nonlinear. So linear equations, all they have is an x. If you have any powers or you have any fractions, they are nonlinear. So an x in the denominator or 
powers was nonlinear. So, we'll do three of these, and we're going to talk about the difference between linear and nonlinear. Linear or nonlinear on this. Okay, so how we distinguish between linear and nonlinear is we look at the x. Do we have any x squareds or x cubed or anything like that? No. What do we have? We have an x, right? All we have is the x's. So this would be linear. Okay, so this one's linear. Let's do another one. We'll do three of these. What would this one be? Linear or nonlinear here? We have an x squared, right? So that means that this one is nonlinear. Why is it nonlinear? Because of the x squared. So that is nonlinear. Let's do another one. What about this one? Linear or nonlinear? What would this one be? Can someone tell me? Well, nonlinear, right? I'll do one of these from your homework. So let's look at let's look at twelve. What about 12 from your homework? Do you think 12 is going to be linear or nonlinear here? What about, what about this question? Linear or nonlinear? Linear, okay. This one would be linear. Why is it going to be linear? It's linear because we don't have any x squares or cubes, nothing like that. And might as well get 13 as well. What about 13? Do you think 13 is linear or nonlinear? Nonlinear. Why is it nonlinear? Because of the x squared. Now, most of the first half of chapter one is linear. Once we hit the second half, we're going to be focusing on more nonlinear equations. Everything we've looked at today has been linear. We've only been solving linear equations. We've got one more quick topic to talk about, and that's simple interest. One more quick topic, and we're going to talk about simple interest. And here's our simple interest formula. The simple interest formula is I equals P R. I is the interest, P is the principal or the starting amount. R is the percentage rate as a decimal. And T is number of years. Number of years, not months, number of years. So you've got two of these questions in your homework. I'm going to work out 15. So I'm going to look at your homework 1.1, and I'm going to work out question 15. So I'm going to put this one up on the screen. We're going to talk about it, and I'm going to work it out for you. There's only two of these. You're going to do 14. 
I'm going to work out 15. Now, when we work these out, we have to make sure that we have our time in terms of years. If it's in months, we have to convert it. So let's read 15 together. On Thursday, we're going to be looking at applications. We're going to be doing more of these, these type of problems. But today, we just have these two. And these are simple interest problems. So question 15. Sophia borrowed $12,109 at 4.5% simple interest for six months. How much will the interest amount to? And how much is she going to have to pay back? And we want that to the nearest cent. Okay, so we need to pick out all the different pieces. So I equals PRT. So let's first begin with our principal. So how much money did she borrow? Okay, she borrowed $12,109. And when we finish this question, this will be it for today. So this is the last question that we're going to work through. So she borrowed $12,109. What about the rate? Okay, it's 4.5%. We convert that to a decimal. And that's 0 0.045. Now, time. Time has to be in years. So this has to be in years. Right now, it's not in years. What's the time in? Months. So the time is six months. So we take that six and we divide it by 12. And then you can either use a decimal or you can use the fraction. I'll just keep it as a fraction because that's easy. That's a half, right? Now we plug it in our formula and we finish it out. So I equals PRT, that's our formula. So I equals then 12,109. We're going to multiply that by 0 0.045. And we're going to multiply that by a half. Now here's how I work these out. What I do is I always divide at the end. So I multiply across the top, and then I divide by that 2 at the end. So I'm going to take my numbers, and I'm going to multiply across. So 12,109, I'm going to multiply that by 0 0.045, and I'm going to multiply that by 1, and that gives me that. So I've got 544.905, and then I'm going to divide that by 2. And then when I divide that by 2, okay, so I multiply it across, Divide that by 2, and what do I get? 272.45. Okay. And what do we want? We want to know how much she has to pay back and the interest. So the interest we found is $272.45. So that's your interest. And then how much do we have to pay back? We have to pay back 12,109. We're going to add to that 272.45. We're going to add those together. And that gives you 12,381 dollars and 45 cents total. So that's how much we have to pay back. Okay. Now, that's it for today. What do we have? What did we cover today? So what are we going to do for your homework? For your homework, you need to complete one point one. So all you need to do is complete that one point one packet. We'll do one point two next time. And if you have questions out of 1.1, we can go over the next class period. I'm not going to pick up 1.1 on Thursday. 
I'll pick that up on Tuesday because I pick up that packet in one, in one piece. So our first due date for any assignments then is going to be that next Thursday, or sorry, next Tuesday, which is August, I think, 30th, isn't it? So that's going to be when our next due date. So that's our, our next due date is the 30th. And if you have questions, be sure and ask them in, in class, next class period. And I will see everyone then on Thursday. Um, who has the sign-in sheet? Make sure you sign the sign-in sheet. And who's got the sign-in sheet? Is that around here somewhere? Oh, thank you very much. Everybody have a great rest of your day. And I will see you then on Thursday.